was a bad kid. And no, I'm not talking about your regular teenage delinquency like trying cigarettes, school detentions, or getting bad grades. I mean really bad. By age 17, I was shoplifting, stealing cars, getting picked up by cops for all sorts of things. Not exactly hurting anyone, but I was a constant headache for my mom and dad. Then after me and dad almost got into an actual fistfight, he kicked me out of the house. I know I deserved it, and I know they figured I'd just go stay with friends for a couple of days because that's exactly what I did. But, me being me, I quickly wore out my welcome at my buddies' houses and ran out of places to stay. But again, me being me, I was way too proud to just go home and apologize. Since it was summertime, I figured it'd be a good idea to head down to the park to find somewhere to sleep. Now, I lived in the inner city back then, so there was a bunch of other actual homeless people already sleeping there, and as soon as I realized I was actually stuck out there for a night, I started to realize that this homeless thing wasn't a game anymore. As it started to get really late, I got to the park at around 11pm and it was like 1am by the time this happened. One of the homeless dudes walked up to me as I started to bed down on the bench and started talking to me. He asked what I was doing and... Being naive, I told him, I'm homeless. He immediately responded by saying, no you're not, and pretty much guessed the whole deal about me having a falling out with my mom and dad. I didn't want to admit that he was exactly right, so I just kept my mouth shut, but I remember him saying something like, really though kid, if you have kin, you need to pay him a visit because I promise you ain't ready for this life. My pride kept me out there for three whole nights, and every single time I curled up on that bench, the same old homeless dude would walk up and be like, Go home, kid. This ain't you. In hindsight, he was exactly right, but at the time, he was just another person to prove wrong. My final night on the streets also happened to be the first that I tried to ingratiate myself with the homeless folk who slept in the park, partially out of boredom, partially out of hunger. My final night on the streets also happened to be the first that I tried to ingratiate myself with the homeless folk who slept in the park, partially out of boredom and partially out of hunger. I'd run out of money, run out of food, and I figured if I hung out with the other guys I could maybe get in on some of their food or something. I asked around, but no one had any spares, until I asked this one guy and he told me to buzz off, and I noticed a Snickers bar sticking out of his coat pocket. My rumbling stomach basically just overrode my brain and, with all the dexterity of a Victorian pickpocket, I slid the thing out of his pocket and walked off. Not my proudest moment, stealing food from a homeless guy when I could have just swallowed my pride and walked home, but it is what it is. So, I go off to hide somewhere so I can devour the Snickers whole, then I walk back to where the other guys are to hang out some more. Maybe like two or three hours later, I'm still trying to ingratiate myself with the homeless guys, but I'm also still pretty nervous around them, for obvious reasons. I figured the guy I stole from is too drunk to even notice that I stole from him. But oh boy, was I wrong about that. Because like I said, a few hours after I stole it, I noticed the guy began to tap his coat pocket, obviously noticing that the candy bar is gone. I'm trying to remain inconspicuous, But I'm also trying to keep my eye on the guy because if he put two and two together and worked out that it was me that stole from him, I wanted enough warning to be able to get out of there. So the guy taps his pocket and when he stops, I can see the cogs turning in his booze-soaked brain as I figured he was thinking, hmm, pretty sure I had some candy in there. But then a few seconds later, he's back taking pulls from his 40 ounce like he'd completely forgotten about the whole thing. Only, he hadn't. And the most shocking thing about what came next was how it went from zero to a hundred in like a second flat. So remember that pull of his 40? He takes one, then two, then a third much longer one, almost like he was trying to polish the whole thing off in a hurry. Which as it turned out, was exactly what he was doing. Because what was once an innocent beverage receptacle soon became a weapon. When he turned to the guy to his right and sent the glass 40 bottles smashing into his face. The guy just collapsed, hands covering his face, same hands with muffled blood curdling screams that he let out. The guy I stole from then started kicking the life out of him. Steal from me? Steal from me, mother effer? 
and out of all the homeless people there, only one actually tried to break it up. And even then, it was just a slurred, they break it up over there, which ended up being totally ignored. I remember turning to the older dude had been nice to me, telling me to go home and whatnot, and I feigned ignorance as I asked him what was going on. The guy said the dude getting beat down was always stealing stuff, so if anything went missing around the park, it was most probably his fault. No one cared, though. No one gave a single worry that this guy was getting his face stomped on, and it was all my fault. Oh, and I mean stomped on. I could hear this guy's face literally crunching under the guy's boot. I knew I should have said something. I know I should have owned up, but believe me when I tell you that I've never been that scared. Not before or after. All I could think of was, if I tell the truth, that'll be my face getting stamped on only. It'll probably be like a hundred times worse because, well, look what I caused. I turned to the nice guy and was like, but what if he didn't steal it? What if someone else stole it? The guy looked at me and his eyes went all wide and he leaned in and said, Don't say a word, kid. Just leave. Leave and never ever come back. As I walked away, I could still hear the guy getting his butt beat, and although I never found out what happened to him, I don't see anyone being able to survive the kind of head injuries he got. That very same night, maybe at around 2am, I walked back to my parents' house and banged on the front door until my dad woke up and answered. I just blurted out this big, long apology about being a total idiot and not appreciating what I'd had. I'm pleased to say that that was the first step on the road to being a decent human being, because almost everything I did before that had little to no consequences, or rather, what little there were didn't bother me. But that night I stole the candy bar, I actually saw how bad the repercussions could be, and honestly, I had no idea they could ever be that bad, just for taking a candy bar. I feel equal parts shame and horror when I look back on it, my pride and greed caused me to do something shameful and my cowardice might have cost a relatively innocent man's life. I wish it had never happened, but at the same time, if it didn't, who knows, I might be still hanging out in that park today, if I'd even be alive at all. I had a real rough upbringing. I won't bore you with the little details, but my parents weren't in the picture. I was in and out of abusive foster homes, and when I was 16, I spent a long couple of months sleeping on the streets. Lots of messed up stuff happened, I mean, a lot, and sometimes I feel like I could write a book of all the scary stuff I had to go through during my teenage years. But this one thing is by far the most frightening thing that happened. The worst thing is that the guy caught me when I was really, really hungry. Otherwise, I might have had the good sense to realize what was going on. So, like I said, I was bumming around, trying to scrape together a couple of bucks to get some food. I was standing at a crosswalk with a sign that said, 16, homeless and hungry. And every time the lights went red, I'd walk out and flash my sign to them and hope they'd toss me their pocket change. Sometimes it worked, sometimes not, and on this particular night, people didn't seem to be feeling generous at all. All until this one guy pulled up, got out of his car, and was like, Oh my god, honey, are you okay? He seemed so kind, and I was just feeling so weak, and the sudden act of apparent kindness was almost too much for me. So I'm holding back tears as I'm telling him how hungry I am, and as he asks if he can take me to get some food before helping me find a place to stay, all I could think about was the food. I know I shouldn't have done it. I know I shouldn't have gotten in the guy's car, but I was young. I was naive. I figured, if anything happens, I can just run away or call for help. I even pictured myself like ducking and rolling from the car if he tried driving me anywhere secluded. You know, like they do in the movies. So as dumb as it sounds to say it now, I actually felt kind of safe. But if I'm being honest with myself, all I was thinking about was the idea of a burger or something. I was practically salivating just thinking about it. When he asked me where I had in mind, I 
think I said Wendy's or something because I remember us driving past one, pointing it out to him and he just ignored me. That's when I realized something was wrong and I started to ask him why he hadn't stopped at the Wendy's. That's when this formerly really kind person turned into a monster right before my eyes. Shut up, was all they said. They didn't even take their eyes off the road while saying it. But hey, I had my little backup plan, and I wouldn't even have to tuck and roll at high speeds. We were still in the inner city by that point with stoplights every quarter of a mile or whatever. So I just shut my mouth, waited until we were at a stoplight, unlocked the passenger door, then pulled on the door handle. Nothing. I pulled on it again. Still nothing. I pulled it a third time and that's when I noticed that it didn't feel right. Like it felt hollow almost. Like it wasn't connected to anything. And I suppose that's because it wasn't. I can remember that horrible sinking feeling that went through me even today. Realizing it was a trap. Realizing that there was no way out. When I started screaming and bashing on the car window, he just turned up the stereo and ran a red light so I couldn't alert anyone. Then, and I don't even really know what came over me, but in a panic, I kind of leaned back in my seat and started bashing the windshield with my bare feet. I kicked and kicked and kicked until the glass began to crack, and the guy trying to kidnap me couldn't do much about it as he had to keep his eyes on the road. Yeah, he threw a few punches, and they sure did hurt, but... I still had enough freedom to do some serious damage to his car's windshield. Then, it's his turn to scream at me, telling me how I'm dead, I was going to make me beg to be killed before the end. It was terrifying, sure, but I knew I'd gotten to him. So I'm just screaming, yeah, well screw you too. Then, out of nowhere, blue and red lights and the whoop of a police siren, and you should have seen the guy's face. He looked like he'd seen a ghost, like the color just drained from his face as he looked into the rear view. I didn't think I was out of the woods yet. I thought I'd have to endure some crazy police chase or something and even then, the guy might just pull out a gun and kill us both. But no. He pulls what turned out to be a stolen car over, jumps out, and then just runs off as fast as his legs could carry him. To this day, I've never been so happy to see the cops. These days... I have my life together and I've learned to dread seeing those same blue and red lights in my rear view. It usually means a speeding ticket or a driver's safety course. Okay, I get it, I'm not the best driver. But sometimes, just sometimes I remember the feeling I get when the cops pulled me out of that car. Just complete, all-consuming, gratifying relief. Their intervention helped me get back into foster care and for the first time, I actually felt at home with the family I was assigned to. And the best thing about that night, I actually got my Wendy's. All thanks to the cops that rescued me. So thank you guys. I owe you literally everything. I can't even think of the words to really describe the feeling of dread I got whenever I looked up and saw those little white flakes begin to fall. You'd see kids and other folks get all excited, especially around the holidays. But for people out on the streets, snow meant just one thing. Death. I'll just share one story with you because too many will just get me down. I used to collect a lot of scrap to get money from the recycling place and... A lot of times I'd stop off at this place I knew Pete stayed at. This guy Pete was a few years older than me and he was one of those few homeless guys you meet that isn't a complete jerk in some way. Most of the time it's drugs or alcohol and that's the person's problem. Sometimes it's mental illness. But Pete was like the most normal, well-adjusted person I'd ever met out on the streets. I never got a story and I'm sure it was tragic but Pete was a good guy. A real good guy. So, this one year, it was my second year of being homeless. It snows really heavy come winter time. The previous year had been cold, but all we got was slush, and as much as that sucks, the moisture tends to keep things slightly above deadly temperatures. But then my second year, we got this really dry snow, and the temperatures dropped to like 20, maybe 25 degrees. I walked past Pete's little section of alleyway, and 
He's not there. His little alcove is empty, so I start to worry. A few days go by. The weather gets worse, but I had a place in a derelict building with a bunch of sterno, and I figured since Pete actually had his stuff together, he might have done the same. So one day, I'm headed back along with my old scrap route, and I have to walk past Pete's place. To my absolute relief, I see a pile of sleeping bags and cardboard laid out, signifying he was home. So, I walk up, sorry to wake him, but happy to see him, and I'm all like, Hey, Petey. Terrible weather we're having, buddy. How about them Yankees? Petey was a Mets guy, so every single time I gave him that greeting, even if he was asleep, he'd just rear out of his bag and give me a F the Yankees. But this time, Pete doesn't move. It was like a scene in a movie or something. I'm going, Pete, you there, buddy? Just walking right into the inevitable as I lean down near him and pull up the section of sleeping bag covering his head and he was blue. I didn't cry. Not right away. It was the first body I'd ever found, so I remember just recoiling in horror and wanting to get away from him. I walked a few blocks, and my head was spinning, and when I finally kind of came to, I was able to dial 911 and told them where to find the body. He was gone by that night. Thankfully, I'm not homeless anymore and I don't really like to talk about my time on the streets all that much, not to people who don't know me from that life. But of all the people that died, the ones you really remember are the people who seem like they might get off the streets any day now. They're just that one phone call away to a cousin, or that one job interview away from freedom, and then they get snatched away from you by something as meaningless as the weather. It wasn't drugs or booze that killed Petey, no. He was murdered, and society got the blood on its hands. Back in early 2020, I was doing pretty badly financially. I was behind on rent, my hours at my job had just been cut, and almost all my money was being funneled into vet bills for my cat, who thankfully fully recovered from their surgery. But then boom, the pandemic hit and it was devastating. You see, I live out here in California where the restrictions have been particularly harsh and they were most definitely at their harshest during the summer of 2020. When I lost my job, I would claim unemployment, but when it came to my apartment, I decided it would just be better to find an alternative form of accommodation for a while. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how I started living in my car. It sucked just as hard as you can imagine, and as a result, I only lasted about 10 days before I just threw in the towel and moved back in with my parents up near Eugene. But in those 10 days, I had some seriously freaky stuff happen to me, and probably the most unexpected and therefore the creepiest was somewhere I least expected it. So just for clarity's sake, I'm a girl in my early 20s, not particularly tall, not particularly strong, and after searching for a relatively safe place to park up every night... I ended up finding a quiet little cul-de-sac that seemed as safe as far as any I knew to park up and get some sleep. Best thing about it was it was mostly office spaces, so I could just take up empty spaces at night and leave before anyone showed up to complain. The only active place was this all-night McDonald's, and I always figured it was a good place to park near since it meant food, coffee, and a bathroom to wash up in. So one night, before I'm about to sleep, I feed Oscar, my cat, and check my surroundings to make sure it's pretty much all clear. The only person around is a guy sitting at the outdoor seating at McDonald's, but he's not looking at me, not doing anything remotely creepy, so I figured it's safe to go to sleep. I don't even know how much time passed before I wake up to the sound of Oscar yowling. I figured it might be another cat outside, so I tell him to be quiet, but he won't. Oscar kept yowling, then hissing at something. The moment I opened my eyes, I knew something was wrong. I parked in the same place every night, slept in almost the same position every night, and the position I slept in meant there was always this annoying beam of light coming in my window from the McDonald's across the street. So when I opened my eyes and I wasn't immediately half-blinded by the floodlight, I knew something was up close against my car. 
Then when I looked, I swear, a legitimate chill went up my spine. Some guy, and I don't know if it was the same one eating when I went to sleep, was pressed right up against the glass, hands around his eyes like goggles so he can see into the dark car and he's just staring directly at me. He didn't look particularly scary. I think he just had a dark colored windbreaker on and I know he had short, neatly cropped hair. He looked so normal, but it wasn't so much how he looked as the way he was looking at me. Eyes all wide, a slight curl to his lips, almost like he's thinking of all the possibilities that come from having found a vulnerable, sleeping girl. The fact that Oscar was ready to claw his face off didn't seem to faze him. He was just fixated on one thing, and one thing alone. Me. I swear to God, no one's ever made me feel like that ever. Not before that night, and not after either. It's like he didn't see me as a person. More like he'd found a $20 bill on the floor, something he could just take. Luckily, I kept all my doors locked, so there was no danger of him getting into the car unless he broke a window. But that didn't make it any less frightening when he was leaning up, looking around, and suddenly tried to open one of my car doors. I grabbed my phone, sat up, and started screaming for him to get away from my car, saying that I was going to call the cops, and I'm calling 911 right now. At that, he just started walking away from the car like nothing had happened. I saw two people stop and say something to him on the way into the McDonald's, but he just shrugged it off, walked into the darkness, and disappeared. By the time the cops showed up, he was long gone, and it wasn't like he'd committed any real crimes to file a report. But still, the cops were really understanding, told me I'd done the right thing, but also advised me to scout out some other potential sleeping situations. Definitely not the most helpful cops I've ever dealt with. But the guy who took my report was really understanding and was actually there for me, unlike his cold partner who I swear was only moments away from rolling his eyes at me. That was the worst thing about living in my car. People treat you like a human being until the very second you let it slip out, and then it's like a race to find out what's wrong with you. Drugs, mental breakdown, scandalous divorce. Oh, it always has to be something negative too, like I can't just be down on my luck because of a freaking global pandemic. Not everyone was like that, but enough. Enough to make it a problem. So please, homeless people need a lot of things. Compassion, financial and moral support. But they definitely don't need your judgment. I used to stay in some abandoned warehouses here in the UK, and not like the kind you're thinking. These are old Victorian buildings that I think might have been part of the cotton industry, but don't quote me on that. The point is, they're about six floors up and are still in pretty decent condition if you can ignore the mice and the leaky sections. Anyway, I was much younger when this all happened. I was almost freshly 18 and I was coming to the end of my life on the streets, because what happened next motivated me to get my act together, stop drinking, and get on the list for emergency housing. So as I was saying, I used to walk all the way up to the third or fourth floor whenever I slept in this place, just to try and be as safe as possible. It wasn't unusual for certain unsavory types to wander into the lower floors to do all sorts of horrible stuff, and I liked to be about as far away from that kind of thing as possible if I wanted to get any sleep. But then this one night... I wake up to the most horrible sound of screaming I'd ever heard. I can't even find the right words for it. Like a proper death scream. Just made my skin crawl when I heard it. I was so frightened that I couldn't move at first, but then I also knew I had to do something, at least to try and make it stop. If I was screaming like that, I'd want someone to come and help me too. But then, by the time I actually got up and went downstairs, the screaming suddenly stopped. I kept going just in case, but there was nothing down there, not a single person to be seen. I figured maybe just there had been an argument or something, God forbid, maybe a ghost. But the truth was much more frightening. I went back upstairs to get some sleep, thinking it was all safe again, and when I wake a few hours later to try to get some breakfast from the Catholic mission across town, I can hear the police radios before I'd even seen them. They'd found a body of a girl just outside the entrance to where I was sleeping, 
and since I admitted to being in the area the night before, didn't have a leg to stand on really, I actually ended up being part of a murder investigation. It sounds grim, but it was actually quite nice. It broke up the monotony of my days, going to and from the police station to give statements and have my fingerprints taken and all of that. And I know that probably sounds horrible to most of you, hearing me taking a measure of joy in that girl's death, and I get it, it's horrible of me, probably one of the lowest points in my life. But that's what I needed. That's what I needed to finally be like, hang on, this isn't worth it. This trying to live like an outlaw just is not worth it. I've lived with mental health problems for most of my life too, and I don't think I was quite ready to face it at the time. But realizing that some girl's death had become an event to me, I just thought, something needs to change. I can't say I'm doing too brilliantly today, but I definitely am better than I was. Most people wouldn't even know I'd ever been homeless by looking at me. But although that part of my life seems almost like it happened to someone else now, I still have the memories of those screams to remind me that it was very, very real. Back in 2015, I was working in this super high-income mountain town up in Colorado. I could only barely afford rent, even with two different jobs up. But since I was only there for like a month and it was only through July and August, I figured I'd turn the whole thing into an extended camping trip, which is about 50% a great idea and about 50% an awful idea. But God didn't make for some awesome experiences, some awesome ones and some pretty terrifying ones too. So, the job I'm in, you work short-term contracts. It's tough work, and it's a real work-hard, play-hard kind of attitude. So you drink every night after work, even if you don't have the cash. Someone will just buy for you, then expect you to pay it forward. Anyways, we get trashed. Stay at this bar until closing time, then when we get kicked out, we go our separate ways. Him heading back to whatever roach-infested motel he'd booked himself, and... Me heading back to the majestic freedom of my one-man tent, or that's just what I told myself anyways. So, I'm walking back to my tent, just going to town on some gyros, good Greek food in Colorado, who knew. Then I climb into my tent, lie on top of my bag, and drift off to sleep. The next thing I know, and this was like an actual monster movie or something, I wake up to these big crunches of twigs and stuff, as something big is obviously moving around my tent. Immediately, I think bear, and I'm right. Just from its grunts, I can hear that it was probably a black bear. The thing must have smelled my gyros from like five miles away and just honed in on me like a pork-seeking missile or something. I still thank God that it didn't come around to the front of my tent, which I, like a complete idiot, had forgotten to close up. Instead, the bear sticks its muzzle into the material of my tent like inches from my face. It was one of the singular most horrifying moments of my life, waking up to that thing literally sniffing me out. I did the only thing I could think of, and it sounds incredibly goofy in retrospect, but I... I booped it. I booped that bear's snout as hard as I could, then just waited for it to tear through my tent and eat my face off. But it worked. I scared the bear. With a boop. I didn't sleep a single wink that night. In fact, I think it was about 20 minutes or so before I just packed up my stuff and threw it into my trunk, then drove over to my buddy's motel to see if there was any rooms free. There weren't. So I slept in my trunk, in the parking lot, then talked to my buddy into letting me share his room the following morning. Definitely not my most dignified moment, but better than running into that black bear again. Way back when I was homeless, there was this local homeless shelter I would stop to get food at, and sometimes, if you were lucky enough to get there in time, you could get a bed for the night. Only, because of the rough neighborhood it was in, if you walked all the way down there for a bed for the night and couldn't get one, you were basically stuck in one of the worst areas of the city until you could escape it on foot. Other homeless people might try and rob you. Some guy got knifed in front of me one time, and if you tried to bed down there, there was a good chance some drunk idiots would come along and kick the life out of you just for fun. 
but by far the worst I ever saw was while walking out of that area one night when I was using the alleys to try and not attract attention. And out of nowhere, I start hearing this weird, like, grunting sound. So I double back to check it out. At the back of an abandoned lot, I saw this crazy animal of a man, naked from the waist down on top of someone who I assume was a woman, thrusting on top of them. Every couple of seconds he would stop to throw a punch. The woman was unconscious, completely limp and both her and the guy's fists were covered in blood. I yelled out to him to stop, then he just turned to look at me. I've seen a lot of real messed up things in my life, but that look in his eyes was beyond animalistic. It was like the lights were on, but no one was home, you know? And the way the orange security light was reflecting off them made him look even more inhuman. I was so scared. I wanted to do something, but all I could bring myself to do was run to the nearest payphone to call the cops. I know that makes me sound like a coward, and that I should have stopped the guy because now the girl could be dead for all I know. But I just didn't know what else to do. There could be two dead people, and I don't think this way anymore, but for a while after, I thought it might be better to be a dead hero than live like a coward how I feel now. I just hope whoever it was that he was hitting is doing okay these days. Some people never find a way off the streets, but some do, and I hope she was one of those. As for the guy, there's not a punishment in hell too good for him, and I hope he got his karma in the end. I made this throwaway account because I don't want this associated with my regular one since I got my life back together. A few years back, I used to, how do you put it, sell services to guys via Instagram, which helped me get out of being homeless after a few months. It's not something I ever thought I'd end up doing, but I was desperate to get out of my predicament, and so I did what I had to do. I'm definitely not the worst looking girl, and when I had long hair, that attracted a lot of old men. Some lonely, some a little weirder. I never really had problems with other homeless people because I stayed in a local city shelter at night and had to leave during daytime. Hanging around convenience stores and parking lots where they have game rooms, slot machine rooms as they say, is where I got most of my clients. Most of them were chill, get what they want and leave. But some of them, some of them were crazy. One guy in particular wanted me to stay at his place overnight and spend the next day with him for a thousand dollars. I decided okay. It was a lot of money for one night, so we went over to his place. Turned out the guy had what I can only describe as a torture dungeon in his garage. Had some type of black filament with egg cartons all over the walls and some really weird stuff laying around. I decided it wasn't a good idea and said I changed my mind telling him I wasn't into that kind of stuff, but he wouldn't let me leave. We were yelling back and forth for a while, and that's when he punched me in the collarbone. I just kind of froze for a second, like, oh no, and punched him back as hard as I could, right in the face. What followed was a chase all the way through his house, right back to the front door. Twice he caught up with me. The first time I managed to kick him away, then the second time he almost got on top of me to choke me. His blood and spit were dripping on my face as he screamed about how he was going to kill me. How no one would care about a cheap... Well, you get the idea. How I managed to get out of there, I don't know. I just kept fighting the whole time and somehow ended up outside in the street. Then I just remember running and running until I could find a safe place to get myself together. The worst thing was, when I saw a cop car, my first thought was to run and hide again because... I didn't know if this guy had called it an assault or whatever, but this evil SOB was planning on doing God knows what with me in his garage. But no, it was me that had to worry about getting arrested. I'm just glad I'm able to put all that behind me now, but I'd be lying if I said I don't constantly think about those that haven't been able to. I want to get involved in a homelessness charity or something, maybe some kind of outreach program, because every so often I think about those sorts of things and think, that could just as easily have been me. I 
Born on March 20th of 1988 in Mexico City, Itzacoto Ocampo was the oldest son of two Mexican migrants who eventually came to settle in the Orange County suburb of Yorba Linda, California. After spending the first 12 years of his life in the state, his parents gained American citizenship for both them and their children, and Itzacoto would go on to graduate from Anaheim's Esperanza High School in the summer of 2006. His high school friends would later remember Ocampo as a warm and friendly young man, and it was this demeanor that won him many friends during his education. But something happened during his school years that had a profound effect on Ocampo. The attack on New York's Twin Towers in September of 2001. Following what proved to be one of the most devastating terrorist attacks in world history, Ocampo's friends noticed a distinct shift in his personality. He became dark and brooding, fostering an intense interest in the politics of the Republican Party, and particularly the foreign policies of then-President George W. Bush. It was also around this time that Ocampo became the victim of a rather intense campaign of bullying by what his friends later described as a bunch of rich jocks. Whether or not this affected his decision to join the U.S. Marines is unclear, but we know that as of July 2006, he was stationed at Camp Pendleton in Oceanside, where he was attached to the 15th Regiment of the Medical and Sanitary Battalion. In 2008, Ocampo was deployed to Iraq with the 1st Supply Battalion to Iraq, but it's evident that he didn't see combat during his eight months in country. His job was to transport water and fuel to combat soldiers deeper in the field, and although he certainly faced all the dangers presented by an active insurgency, Ocampo was never actually under fire at any point. We also know that at some point during his tour, there was an incident in which Ocampo pointed a loaded weapon at an allied soldier. Although it's not clear which nationality the soldier was, Ocampo was severely punished for his indiscretion. He was demoted, docked pay, and assigned extra work duties as penance. Despite this worrying episode, Ocampo still received all the appropriate commendations for his tour, including the Iraq Campaign Medal, Global War on Terrorism Service Medal, and the National Defense Service Medal. His superiors apparently viewed his outbursts as an unfortunate but unavoidable part of serving in an active war zone. Ocampo was stressed, he acted out, but he didn't hurt anyone and he took his punishment like a man. And it seems his later behavior is better explained by an event which occurred back in the States. After returning to Camp Pendleton, Ocampo experienced a traumatic brain injury when the latch to his seven-ton failed to lock and slammed into the back of his head. He was medically discharged at the worst possible time, right as the U.S. was falling into a recession. Ocampo struggled to find work, eventually settling for low-paid work as a landscaper, all the while his life fell apart around him. He discovered that his father was addicted to drugs, causing Ocampo's mother to divorce him. They also lost the house as a result of this addiction, and the pain this must have caused its koto is frankly immeasurable. Around July 2010, Ocampo began to show signs of complex PTSD, first noted when he began to exhibit what we might call deviant behavior. A serious factor for the deterioration of his mental state was the death of his close friend Patino, who died in Afghanistan's Helmand province during combat in the summer of 2010. Following his death, its Kotal became depressed and increasingly dependent on alcohol. Over the next two years, unable to adapt to a normal life and hold a job, he depended on income from relatives and refused treatment from psychiatrists, insisting he was unqualified to be diagnosed for PTSD because he did not fight in combat. By the end of 2011, his mental state had deteriorated sharply, to the point of developing hypochondria and showing signs of clinical delirium. Then, on October 25th of 2011, Ocampo suddenly appeared on the doorstep of his old high school classmate, 24-year-old Eder Herrera. Eder lived with his 53-year-old mother, Raquel, along with his older brother, Juan, and both were present when Ocampo unexpectedly lunged at them, stabbing both Raquel and Juan more than 30 times each. The Herrera's neighbors witnessed the murders, providing police with a description of the offender's appearance and his clothing. 
but because Aether and Ocampo were similar in appearance, the grieving Aether was arrested in a shocking display of police negligence. Despite denying any involvement in the deaths of his mother and brother, he was still considered the main suspect when it was revealed that, shortly before the crime, he had gotten into some kind of verbal altercation with them, as per a statement from their neighbors. Just short of two months later, on the evening of December 21st, Ocampo was loitering around the parking lot of a shopping center in Placencia, when he suddenly attacked a 53-year-old homeless man named James McGillivray. McGillivray's bloody execution by stabbing was recorded on CCTV, and the police managed to release a composite photo of the killer in the hopes of cutting Ocampo's spree short. But a week later, Ocampo committed another murder. This time, the victim was 42-year-old homeless man Lloyd Middow, who spent most of his time under a bridge crossing the Santa Ana River in Anaheim. Middow, like McGillivray, was found stabbed almost 60 times, as if the killer had entered some kind of frenzy that they'd struggled to come down from. Two days later, Ocampo killed another homeless man, stabbing 57-year-old Paulus Smith more than 50 times before discarding his body in the parking lot of a public library in Yorba Linda. And by the time Ocampo killed for a fourth time, news about the homeless deaths in Orange County began to spread like wildfire among local and national media outlets. Then, in early January of 2012, several newspapers published a series of articles about the investigation into the killings. One included an article in the Los Angeles Times in which a reporter interviewed a 64-year-old Vietnam War veteran named John Barry who spoke extremely negatively about the perpetrator and urged any potential victims to be as careful as they can in order to avoid being the next victim. Barry's words signed his own death warrant and as a result, Ocampo traveled all the way over to Anaheim to begin stalking Barry. The following evening, Ocampo found Barry near a Carl's Jr. in Anaheim, then, after waiting for the right moment to strike, he attacked and stabbed Barry in front of dozens of witnesses, fleeing on foot after killing him. These witnesses obviously rushed to call 911, and Ocampo was arrested while trying to dispose of his bloody clothing just several hundred meters away from the crime scene. Police confiscated a 7-inch stainless steel blade from him, one that was soaked with John Barry's blood. Homicide detectives then discovered that the murder weapon matched the one in the killings of the three other homeless men, and Ocampo was now confirmed to be the Orange County homeless killer. Only later were the murders of his school friend's mother and brother tied to his maniacal spree, and after learning of his cruelty, Orange County District Attorney Tony Rokakis confirmed that he would seek the death penalty during the upcoming trial. Ocampo's trial was scheduled to begin on January 17, 2014, Yet on the evening of November 27, 2013, Ocampo somehow managed to get a hold of a bottle of Ajax and was found dead after having swallowed the entire bottle. It was the coward's way out, a way of retaining the dignity that he had denied to so many others in his brief but tumultuous life. Was its Koto Ocampo evil? Or was he a product of a broken society, suffering in his own personal hell, who found that killing was his one true way of getting back at a system he once had so much faith in. My name is Ali. I'm 33 and from the ages of 19 to 23, I was addicted to heroin. How I got hooked is a story on its own, but I have a better story to tell here and that's how I got clean. I say better story, but it's still not a good one. In fact, it's actually pretty horrifying. But it was what I needed to get clean, so silver linings, I guess. Anyway, about 18 months into my addiction, I got kicked out of my apartment, and my family didn't want anything to do with me. I really can't blame them. So I ended up out in the streets. I was 21, 5'2", and 110 pounds soaking wet, so needless to say... I was pretty vulnerable. I think I'd have been more scared if I wasn't focused on scoring all the time. That's scoring drugs, not, you know. But as you can imagine, life for a young woman out on the streets is not a good one. And Jesus Christ, is it scary. So first thing you learn is that you need protection. Basically, and as a feminist I hate to say this, 
you need a man. Now, I was lucky. Most girls don't get a choice, but I happened to hook up with a guy who had been an addict for about the same time as me, who was only a few years older. We didn't just get together so it'd be easier to score. We actually liked each other, and after a while, I'd say we fell in love. We spent the next two years together, just trying to get by, occasionally trying to kick the habit and facing all the hardships that came with the lifestyle altogether. Together, that was the important thing. It was the only thing that mattered. But I can't quite bring myself to type his name for a number of reasons, and you're about to learn the main one real soon. So this guy would do anything to protect me, and I mean anything. He stole from me, hurt people from me, but only when I needed to be defended. We were each other's whole worlds. And when we got three months in county for his third shoplifting offense, he had an immaculate record before his addiction. I missed him like I'd never missed anyone else, not even my whole family. I want to say that I was able to make it by without him, but that's not the case. And when he finally got released, I literally wept with joy. I was so happy to see him. The cops had forced him to get clean in the county and the first thing he wanted to do when he got out was get high again. Luckily, I'd planned a little homecoming party in advance which consisted of nothing more than a ten bag of dope. So, we quickly found a safe, quiet place to nod out then started spiking up. He went first, then shot up the second half of the needle and we fell asleep in each other's arms. Something I'd missed so much I can barely find the words to describe. The last thing I remember is him trying to pull away from me and I figured it was to go pee or something. I'd missed him so much that all I remember is tugging at his sleeve, not wanting to let him go. I'd waited months for that cuddle and he could wait a minute longer, just a minute longer. The next thing I know I'm opening my eyes and I can still feel the guy's arm around me. You know when you just wake up and it's like you're not fully logged in yet? That's a thousand times worse when you're on dope. Like it was actually like, huh? Who is this? Before a second before I remembered my man was out. So naturally I feel this warm, fuzzy feeling. I wiggle back into him and I pull his arm tight around me. Then I reach for his hand to lace my fingers between his like he always used to like. And it's cold. Not just October and Chicago cold, like I need a pair of gloves cold, stone cold, the kind of cold that made me realize something was horribly wrong. I barreled out from under him, spun around, tried to shake him awake, but it was no good. I remember I screamed so hard that I puked and that caused someone to come running to check on us. After that, I'm not sure how long, the cops and the EMT showed up and I had to answer a bunch of questions. It was OD, by the way, in case you were wondering. He just shot a little too much after being clean for a few months and his tolerance had plummeted so much that, yeah, his body just gave out. The worst thing is, though, as he was overdosing, he obviously tried to get away to get himself help or something. That's what the tugging must have been. A minute later, he must have slipped away unconscious. All the while, I was cuddled up all snug in his arms. I slept with this corpse for maybe five or six hours and that's something I still think about, usually at least once a day. I think about my addiction, how grateful I am to be clean and that's the first thing to pop into my head. I can't type his name because it just tears me up inside, like it's the most triggering thing for me, so please forgive me that I'd neglect such an obvious little detail. I can't type his name because even though we were addicts, I loved him with all my heart. I loved him, and in some ways I feel like I killed him. He was clean. I brought him the shot that killed him. It's my fault. It's all my fault. And that's something that I'll never, ever get over. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official. And maybe even hear your story featured in the next video. If you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon. 
or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered on the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends, and be sure to finish your gabagool. <laughs>